Hello and welcome to the Late Fragments podcast in which I discuss the apparently verboten subjects of politics, money, sex and religion with remarkable octogenarians. This week I'll be talking to Martin Bell, best known to many as the man in the white suit. A familiar face on our television screens for many years, there was hardly a front line that he didn't report from. In 1992, several months after the outbreak of the Balkan War, he was seriously wounded by shrapnel while recording a report in Sarajevo. In April 1997, a matter of weeks before the general election, he announced that he was leaving the BBC and standing as an independent candidate in the Tatton constituency in Cheshire. When he overturned the Conservative majority there, he became the first successful independent MP since 1951. Now an ambassador for UNICEF, the 85-year-old Bell hasn't lost his interest in the state of the world he's living in. I suppose you could say, I'm a fully paid up member of the Awkward Squad, he says. I hope you enjoy listening. Martin Bell, welcome to Late Fragments. Pleasure to be with you. We're going to talk, first of all, if that's okay, about money. All right. Your father, Adrian Bell, sounds like he wasn't an affluent man, but he was a man who made an awful lot of sacrifices. My father was a, a man who fled to the countryside to escape from an office life. He would otherwise, like his father, my grandfather, have probably ended up in the London Observer, of which my grandfather was the uh, assistant editor. My other grandfather was the director of music of the Land of the Band of the Lifeguards. That's an interesting ancestry. He never had a lot of money. He he made enough. He bought a farm, a small, had a small farm bought for him when he was about 21, 80 acres. You couldn't make a living off that then, and you can't now. He had another small farm in East Suffolk in the 1950s, uh, and he sold that. He then had three children, my elder sister Anthea, Sylvia and myself, the younger twins, and he resolved, because he didn't like the local schools, to send us all to fee-paying schools, uh, the girls as much as the boy. So he had to raise the money to send me to the Lees at Cambridge, later uh, King's College, Cambridge, and before that a prep school north of Norwich. So he sold up. And he made his money in other ways. With the money he got from the farm, he bought a riverside house in Beckles on the border between Norfolk and Suffolk. And he made his money originally by writing the Times crossword puzzle. He wrote the first one, which was published in February 1930, and the 10,000th just before his death. It wasn't very remunerative. It started at three guineas, then went up to five, then a bit more. He also wrote books. His early novels, they were disguised autobiographies, were about farming life in Suffolk in the 1920s. There was a trilogy called Corduroy, the Silver Lee, the Cherry Tree, which sold extremely well, and they were very popular in the 1930s. And soldiers would take them to the war in their kit bags in the paperback penguin form uh, to remind them of the England they thought they were fighting for, although that was all the farming was already becoming agribusiness, and my father chronicled that change. And also, for more than 30 years, he wrote a weekly column in the Eastern Daily Press, the Norwich Daily Newspaper, every Saturday called A Countryman's Notebook. And that sort of, that kept him uh, more or less solvent, but there was never a lot of money in the family, no. Was that something that you were aware of as a child? I was very much aware that my father locked himself away all morning. He mm. suffered from migraines. There'd be groaning noises coming from his study. And I would go in with a, a glass of something to sustain him about half past 12. Uh, and he'd then work again in the afternoon. He did a lot of gardening as well. Uh, and during the time he was uh, still farming, he kept pigs. He was a, quite a practical country country man. No holidays and that sort of thing. Didn't do holidays. That day never rose. Holidays were spent with cousins elsewhere in Suffolk or Norfolk. I never had a holiday until one of my cousins tragically died at the age of about 14 and we all went off to Ilfracombe in North Devon. First time I was ever in a hotel. But no, there were no holidays at all and they were just not on the horizon. No, and you've 
You've said before, uh, I know you got a double first at Cambridge and worked very hard, and you've said before that maybe you could have had slightly more fun than you did, but you had a strong sense that you had to succeed in order not to let your father down. Also, because i just come from non-studying for two years in the army, you had no choice in those days. You had It was conscription. Mm-hmm. So I was wrenched away from the family for two years in Cyprus. And I found it very difficult to come back, even in the surroundings of King's College, Cambridge, and learn to study again. My first year's results were 2-2, two, two, the second was a 2-1. It was only my third year I really got in my stride. So it was... Uh, it, it was a hard slog getting back into it. But I learned more in two years in the army than I learned in three years at Cambridge. Much more. You spent 33 years, I believe, at the BBC as a war correspondent. And I'm wondering whether money or the making of it ever motivated your career choices. I thought I had the best job in the world. Um, I never asked for a pay rise. I just, I was very pleased to be doing the job I was doing. I just loved almost every minute of it. Uh, ranked and on fancy titles didn't matter to me. And early on, I didn't even want to go on holiday. I was enjoying it too much as a young reporter based at Alexandra Palace in about 1964. I was, in, I was loving it so much that I just didn't want to go on holiday. I wanted to go on doing what I was doing. I'd love to know what you loved so much about it. I was always a kid with a low boredom threshold. I was easily bored. And if you're a foreign correspondent, I think especially a war reporter, it's highly competitive. But you feel that the great scoop is just around the corner. I mean, tomorrow as you're going to get the, the story of your life. You're mostly disappointed, but sometimes you are. You're so cliche. You're, you're, you're witness to living history. You actually see it happening in front of you. Uh, I mean, I've I've walked out of most movies made about the wars I was in, Apocalypse Now and others, because I thought they just didn't get it right. So you absolutely loved your work, and it was never a career in the financial sense of the word. You know, I, I, I didn't do it for the money. They gave me something called a special personal salary, eventually. But I'm amazed now at the the, the salaries that people get, and sometimes how much, sometimes how little they do for it. Uh, everything's everything's changed. But I was very lucky in that the technology was so crude. We There was no rolling news. There was no internet. Uh, you, you put raw stock, raw exposed film. You drove it to the airport at Saigon, put it on, the, on a cargo plane to Paris, then to London, and it would reach London three or four days later and be processed and edited. And they was, the newsreader would say, film has just reached us from. So you actually had the opportunity to go and find things out. Like you were essentially, even if you were really busy, you were filing only once a day. That changed in the early 80s when the light handheld video camera came in and the satellite transmission. When for the first time you could be somewhere like Nicaragua, El Salvador, and you were actually reporting today's news today. Actually, in the morning of today, because it was already, by midday, it was already evening in London. So you had to get up early. But still, you were reporting one story a day, which I found fine. And then when did it stop feeling fine? It stopped feeling fine the, after the Balkan Wars. Um, they, broke, they broke out in, uh, in Croatia and Slovenia first in June 91, uh, Bosnia 92. And the Bosnian War lasted for three and a half years. I was suppose I was the main BBC TV reporter there from start to finish, and it really consumed me, my time, my attention. I was obsessed by it. Uh, I was I was invalided out when I got wounded in August '92, but I was back in by December, and I stayed there till the end. And the Dayton Agreement, which was implemented in January '96. There was a certain transfer of populations. And after that, the world went quiet for me. I was summoned back to London. But they didn't have much for me to do, just an occasional air crash or some a bomb in Manchester or something. And I found the phone wasn't ringing anymore. 
though I don't like being paid for work I'm not doing. Uh, so I actually tried to resign in November uh, 1996, but they wouldn't let me. Instead, they sent me off on a, which is a really good uh, documentary. Well, I like doing it about the first months in office of Kofi Annan, the new Secretary General of the UN. So I followed him around Africa, uh, The Hague, New York, Washington for four or five weeks. And that was just about to be aired when I got an invitation to leave the BBC and stand for Parliament as an independent against one Neil Hamilton. And I, I, t I jumped at it. I had no idea what I was getting into, but I thought it's got to be, as again, the, the man of the low boredom threshold, let's find out what it's like to be an MP. So I I, I didn't, I, well, I resigned from the BBC and John Burt, then Director General, was not overly gracious about it. He said that uh, I would not have been allowed, if and when I lost, to, to get my old job back. So I was essentially fired. So I, so I had to win and fortunately I did. In 1997, after a very successful career as a war correspondent, you became the independent MP for Tatton. And we're talking about money, and you defeated the disgraced Neil Hamilton, who had been taking cash for questions. Who had been accused of taking cash for questions, and who denied it, as he does to this day. But the people made their own determination. But financial... Transparency was something that needed to define you. Because I was elected on a anti sleaze platform, I had to be especially careful. There was one day a headline in a very hostile Daily Mirror How clean is Mr. Clean? You know. Uh, so everything was diligently accounted for. I thought the salary, which was then 60 something thousand pounds a year was okay it's a probably I mean it was not a fortune but I was I certainly didn't do it for the money um, I did it out of interest and because I felt I could make a political impact which short term for a few months or years there was a political impact I was the first independent fully independently elected as an independent MP since uh, they they stopped the university seats in 1951 so it was a bit lonely in the sense that I was all my on my own as the only independent. But I made friends very quickly on both sides. And people used to, I don't think it's really, yes, people used to seek my support for their private members' bills, their causes. They wanted the, the, the signature of the only independent as a sort of uh, certificate of, of validity. We're moving on now naturally to politics and I would be really interested to know you made no secret of the fact that you weren't particularly political yourself. I wasn't party political. I had no political experience whatever. I never dreamed of being an MP. It's something that happened to me. But I brought a lot of real world experience to it. I was an MP at the time of the NATO bombing of, uh, of Kosovo. And I felt I knew a bit about what air power could achieve and, and, and what it couldn't. Is it something that worries you that politicians don't have life experience? I think it's important to have done something with your life and, and bring it to the table, um, so to speak. And I'd done a lot. I'd knocked around in about a dozen wars by the time I came to be a, a member of parliament. Because I was a backbencher, obviously I'm going to get any job in government, I was able to concentrate exclusively on whatever interested me, which was UNICEF courses and defence issues, and of course on constituency issues. I became an expert in the politics of the second runway of Manchester Airport. One of the advantages of being an independent is you, especially if you tell them you'll serve for one term and one term only, you then get the usual hostility that you get as a party MP, yeah. in which the other parties are trying to criticise everything you do and trying to bring you down all the time. I had a free column in the uh, Nutsford Guardian once a month in the Manchester Evening News. No, I was paid £200 for Manchester Evening News. I declared that, and I used that to communicate to constituents. And in 
four years in Parliament, I never put out a single press release. I didn't need to, because the press came to me. Was it fulfilling? In a way, it was. In a way, it was deeply frustrating. I was astonished by the willingness of so many MPs to vote against measures they didn't believe in and favour of measures they did just because of the damned whipping system. You strike me as a man of integrity, which isn't something you'd imagine would sit well in the world of politics. It was a bit of a nightmare, uh, thanks to William Hague, who was then the Conservative Party leader. You know, instead of an independent, you won't sit on any committees. Well, I did. I sat on the Standards and Privileges Committee. And what do you think now? Do you follow politics now? I follow politics. Now, I, I believe we're living in a failed state. I used to have to go to Africa to find a failed state, Sudan, Somalia, Congo. Now I feel we've got one at home. Um, I, I'm not impressed by it. There were some terrific MPs there, but I think the overall quality has declined. Uh, I think the number of MPs who've been... There were something like 15 or 16 MPs sitting as independents because they've been disowned by their own parties now. Mm-hmm. Usually on issues of private misconduct, um, sometimes of a sexual nature, sometimes of a financial nature. Been a lot of by-elections that shouldn't have to be to be held. And this failed state, what do you think is going to happen? I think the people are going to rise up. I think there's an opportunity now for independent-minded MPs within the political parties. But I think our politics is moving in a very curious way quite far to the right. Uh, I, I think the, the, we've never had, we've always had the benefit, well I was an MP long before it, of a system of governance in which our broadcast media had to be neutral. This we don't have anymore. We have Tory television. It's called GB News. And I'm amazed that Ofcom is allowing it to happen with so little sanctions against it. We have MPs of one political party only presenting news programmes. Uh, I think that uh, we're in a situation where the, since the press is now able to control so much of its own narrative, not just... The newspapers, which they always did, but television as well, that there's going to be a, a surge of support for right-wing parties, notably, notably reform. And it's not beyond imagining Conservative Party, as we've known it, could collapse completely. It's happened before. It happened in Canada. It, it could happen. It could happen again. And I think we're going to see a rise in tactical voting in which people will vote uh, against a party rather than for a party. And they'll vote for the party, most likely to bring down the party they want to bring down. That's that's happening. I want to go back to 1992 and a near-death experience that you had. I'm wondering if how that affected your life view. Well, I was brought up as an Anglican, because most young men were then. I went to a Methodist school which I sang my way through the Methodist hymn book. Every Sunday I listened to what seemed to be interminable sermons urging me to become a missionary in India or Africa because the Methodists are big in the mission scene. And that, that sort of turned me off religion. I became, as my grandfather had been, at least an, an agnostic. And then I went out into the wars of the world where I find myself in situations in Bosnia was the classic one where they were, not, if not wars of religion, they were wars sanctioned by religion. For instance, the Bosnian Serbs regarded the Orthodox faith as almost a badge of identity. And I knew a warlord very well whose name was Arkan Zelko Mrasinatovic, 
who recruited from the young men of the Belgrade Football Club, the hooligans. He trained them, armed them, and sent them uh, to be baptised at the great cathedral in, in Dahl, that they were consciously using religion. The same way with the, the Croats, that the priests would spread rumours about uh, massacres in neighbouring villages, whether or not they were true. And one of the things that happens as soon as the war breaks out, a civil war, is that uh, rumour replaces news. There is no news. There are no newspapers. After the all your batteries have gone, the electricity is... You, you've got, there's no radio, no television. So you rely on, on rumour. And a lot of the, a lot of the warfare was fueled actually by the priests. And, uh, and now... Uh, yes, my positive and serve friends warned me that uh, after the war, if the government side won, it would become an Islamic state. Well, it, it hasn't, but the Islamism is much stronger than it used to be. I mean, uh, Sarajevo has got more mosques than Tehran now. I, I would say more mosques than it needs. So, so I'm not religious at all. I suppose I'm irreligious. Uh, and so when I found myself with a near-death experience. Uh, religion was actually no comfort. If you come face to face with your own mortality more often than most people do, which mm. you did, and you don't have the comfort of knowing that there's a salvation on the other side of life, does that make this life feel more important? I think simply being in harm's way, often under fire, gives you a much keener appreciation of being alive. And never have contemplated the reality of there being a God. Well, it'd be a nice idea. I wish the religious people were right. Um, I don't believe in one myself, but how, how pleasant if I find myself at the pearly gates. I think as an unbeliever I'd be thrown out, but it's just, it's always struck me. I mean, there are, there are people have a need for religion. All peoples, since time began. Um, it just seems to be one of those human things, in the same way they have a need to go to war, since time began. There are two in our country, there are two in every village or the town. The main buildings are the castle and the church, or the cathedral. A place to defend you and a place to worship in. And they're both very grand and very old. And I was very lucky to be brought up in the Royal and Ancient Foundation of King's College, Cambridge. And I used to go to Evensong, just for the music and the architecture and the beauty of the language. But, uh, well, I would pretend to believe, but I didn't really. You've seen humanity at its absolute worst, more than most people have. And its best. And it's I've seen the, the heroism of ordinary people helping each other. Not necessarily of the same tribe, but sometimes out of common humanity. You, you really do see a lot of the best of people in, in war zones. So you don't despair? I am running short of hope about our domestic politics, but I can see ways in which it can be rectified. Uh, I don't think we're, I'm the vice president of something called the Movement for the Abolition of War. Well, that's more in hope than in expectation. I think it's going, always going to be with us. Man's inhumanity to man. But what does trouble me is our, the means of mass destruction are, are growing, our ways of killing each other. I mean, in all the wars I was in, there was, we never had drones. Mm. Now, goodness, would I ever use a drone? I'd retreat to the bar and send out the drone to get the pictures. Mm. Where do you find your solace, then, if you don't find it from the idea of a God? I find solace in friendship. You make wonderful friends in the war zones. Uh, and in family. I'm, I'm lucky to be happily married. Whether my wife's happily married, don't ask her. I hope she is. That leads us on very neatly yes. to sex. <laughs> um, you have, you've been married four times. I have been married four times. I liked it so much that I did it four times. <laughs> my first wife was French. Mm -hmm. My second wife was American. My third wife was English. And my fourth wife is also British, but of 
uh, origin in Kosovo. What advice do you give your own daughters about marriage and relationships? I think marriage is like war. It's very easy to get into, but much harder to get out of. So you think very carefully before you embark on it. And most young people, they have two important decisions to make in life. Your choice of career, your choice of partner. Well, the choice of career is easier and less painful to change. I've been very lucky. I've never, I've never been to a proper divorce court. I've never argued. It's always been... In fact, my second wife, who's American, Rebecca, long after we split and got divorced, she even took my name, my surname, which is quite unusual. Have you stayed friends with your wives? Uh, yes, made up, made up, always. It must have been difficult, I imagine, juggling an emotional life with a high-octane professional life. I think it's a very convenient alibi if you're a war reporter. I'd be away for, for sort of weeks on end. I remember when my uh, elder daughter was four and my younger daughter was two. It was the long, hot summer of 1976. I was sent to Angola to cover the trial of some, a show trial of some European mercenaries. And it went on and on and on. I was away for six months, working really hard. You know, I was, I was never flirting or doing things I shouldn't have done, but just the absence, I think, is, uh, is, is bad for your marriage, bad for your kids. Mm. They need father. And I was an absent father for far too long. Well, you're the father of daughters. And as an MP, I, I know that you noted that, that it wasn't terribly representational in the sense that there still aren't many women MPs, really. Do you think it's harder to make your way in the world being a woman? Do you think if you'd been a woman, you wouldn't have had the opportunities that you had? Certainly, the, the, the house I was in, I would have thought the, only about one-fifth of the MPs were women. That has changed. You're getting all-woman uh, all shortlists. I think there are still glass ceilings in some professions. But you see, I, I would... I think... I mean, the whole world has changed. I'd have great difficulty finding a job as a BBC correspondent now, I'm privately educated Oxbridge. It's, uh, they're, they're, they're consciously whittling them down. Yeah. I speak received English. I'd have a, I don't know, I don't know if I'd make it anymore. You're out of fashion. I'm severely out of fashion. I've, um, I, in every way, I'm, I, I always result with, I always had very close relations with the technical team. We would, we would, I would work only, only with people not only really liked but loved. And that applied as much to the great hairy South African cameraman as to the rather attractive Croatian interpreter. We, because you succeed together or you fail together. Mm. I learned that in the army. It's called the buddy-buddy system. Mm. You do not succeed at somebody else's expense. And this is the problem in, you know, I went from one profession where your, your, you know, your, your, your rivals, my rivals were at ITN, my competitors were the other BBC correspondents. Yeah. In the House of Commons, your, your, uh, your opponents are opposite you. Your enemies are beside you because you all, you want the same jobs as the same party. It doesn't apply to an independent, but I was very privileged like that. Before we finish, we should talk about your work that you now do for UNICEF. Uh, as I, when I left the House of Commons a week later, I got a call from UNICEF saying, would I be one of their ambassadors? They've got about 15 or 20 in all walks of life. And they're using for different things. Uh, at that time, I was the one because I was, uh, I'm, so I'm supposed to know how to, take care of myself in dangerous places. They would send me to Somalia, the Congo, uh, Malawi, uh, uh, and, uh, oh, uh, Beirut as well. And uh, I'd lead a little team. I'd come back, I would make a, I would usually make a, a news report about what UNICEF was doing. We'd find a network to take it. Might be Channel 5. I did even work for ITN once. In Yemen, I was rather proud of that. 
Do you still travel? I still travel a little bit. I spent a long time, for a long time I lectured on cruise ships, which is travelling in comfort. I went back to Sarajevo in October, uh, but I do, I do find the travelling much more tiresome than it used to be. In October, I used a wheelchair to go through the airport. It's magical. You go to the front of every queue. Do you mind getting older? I don't like being old. Every morning I wake up hating being old. I always thought old age was something that happened to other people, but yeah. I'm slowly getting used to it. Is there anything to recommend about it? You've got long memories. People occasionally come to you for your experience to, to write something or to say something. I sort of, the other day, I spoke at the Charles Wheeler Awards. Charles Wheeler was the BBC correspondent. I wanted to be, I admired him. And they, they do an uh, annual presentation to some journalist. Uh, this time it went to my friend Christian Amapur of CNN. And all the people they wanted to talk were away in Gaza, so they had to rely on another generation, mm -hmm. myself and Jim Lockley and one other. So I do occasional public appearances. And are you proud of your life, of what you've achieved in your life? I think the variety has been unusual. Uh, war reporter, MP, UNICEF, ambassador. The travelling, I always love travelling. I've travelled, I think, to 121 countries. So I've still got about 40 to go and I'm not. You must have some very admirable passports somewhere. I used to have to have the 64-page passport. And in my BBC days, I'd always travel with two passports. You needed one for Israel, one for everywhere else. You've seen so much more than most of us. What have you learned about the world? I learned that the world is an increasingly dangerous place. I learned that uh, the human being is the most dangerous creature on the planet. No, none other kills its own kind on that scale. None other has the capacity to destroy the planet. So I, and I just look at the wars of the world as they now are, and the and the possibility we have of bombing ourselves into oblivion, and I am fearful for the future certainly. Human beings do have many redeeming qualities, though. They have courage. They have kindness. They have a capacity to help each other. An ability to inspire. In some cases, a real basic goodness but also the ability to destroy each other. I mean, some of the... I've always enjoyed meeting the bad guys, to be quite honest. I found them really interesting. I would actually seek them out. Various warlords. What makes them tick? Who are they? And most of them are dead now. I mentioned Arkan, the Serbian warlord. He was assassinated at the Intercom Hotel. Um, Nikola Kolevich, the vice president of the Bosnian Serbs after Dayton took a gun to his head and he, he shot himself. They are, they are, most, of the, most of them are gone. But I did find they were interesting. I mean, Kolevich was a Shakespearean, a Serbian academic, a Shakespearean scholar. And he once asked me which of the plays of Shakespeare did I think the Bosnian War most resembled. I said, time of Athens, and he laughed. It's the one with the most bloodshed. What did they all have in common? They had interesting backstory. They had something that made them do what they did. Arkan killed a lot of people, personally, in a town called Belyino in northern Bosnia. It was absolutely... No, what makes them tick? And I often reflected I would rather share my cakes and ale with Richard III than Henry V. What matters in this life? What is matters most in this life is to live it in a way that you regret as little as possible. You pass, this, and to be proud of what you have done within reasonable limits. And to, I think you always work with people and against people. But if you're going to have the admiration of the people you work against, that's about as good as it gets. Thank you for listening to Late Fragments with Martin Bell. If you're enjoying the podcast and would like to hear more, please do subscribe on your podcast app of choice, or you can follow us on all the usual social media channels. In the next episode, I'll be talking to the 90-year-old Booker Prize winning author Penelope Lively. 
In the meantime, my thanks to Louis Fulford Smith for the sound production and edit, and to Harry Dundas for the music and original score. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>